Hi, I'm Rohit Tolwa, uh, and what I want to talk to you about today is the changing nature of our world and how we prepare for the shocks that are coming. We know about economic turbulence, we know about political shifts that are happening, and we're hearing more and more about the technologies that might disrupt us. The question now is how do we prepare for that as that's becoming the new normal? Uh, and what I would say is the, fir the first challenge for us is to recognise that part of the problem here is how we respond. We all have a mental model uh, of how the world works, a set of assumptions about what the, what's going on out there. We have to simplify it, we can't possibly deal with everything that's going on. So we create a story around which we align our organisation and that becomes our strategy. And that's brilliant until it stops working, until the world changes sufficiently that our model no longer works. Then the question is what do we do in response to that? And for me, the best example of you know, being challenged in that way is this picture that hangs in Reina Sofia. It was painted by a 16-year-old girl called Angela Santos in the 1920s, and it was her view of the world. When you walk into Reina Sofia, it literally stopped my breath, it was so stunning. But her parents didn't think that. They had her committed to an asylum because they thought this was a heretical view of the world. And that's what happens to a lot of us. We get stuck in our ways of thinking, we get imprisoned by our past ideas that made us successful and we can't get past them. What Jeff Mulgan, uh, uh, the think tank Demos, calls zombie uh, orthodoxies. Those views of the world that we simply can't get past even though we know they're not the right way of responding. So our challenge is to move beyond that and to think about how do we develop our capabilities to respond to a world that is becoming faster, more complicated and where change happens across the globe at the same time. And as we look at the kind of current agenda, what we see is there's some specific things that have come onto the agenda quite quickly recently that are starting to become top of mind for business leaders. And we have the Chief of the UK Armed Forces now saying that the rate of change, the speed of change and the number of issues we have to deal with on a daily basis is more intense than in wartime. And you know, so now we saw what happened at, at the G7 this weekend where Develt, uh called it the end of the West, as we know it. We're, at, we're entering a period where none of the old rules apply, none of the old assumptions can work for us, and we have to start to think very differently about how we navigate through that world. Uh, and what that's raising is a set of questions for business around, why you? People are coming in with innovations, our clients are asking us, why do you charge what you do? Why can't we bypass you? Why can't we do it ourselves? No one ha has a guaranteed right to exist. Uh, and what we see is that that's part of a bigger story of a collision between two worlds. On the one hand, those of us who are born physical, we make cars, we make houses, we run hospitals. We use technology, but we don't see ourselves as a technology-led business. We're now colliding with the likes of Google and Amazon and others who are born digital. For them, the key is about getting the data in any industry and then they believe they can win because it's all about applying the right algorithms. So for Google, they have the world's biggest selling, uh, the world's biggest search engine. They also have the biggest selling mobile phone operating system. A hospital, they, they have, uh, they run two airports, uh, and they have um, driverless vehicle that's driven more miles than anyone else. And now they have a company that hopes to extend your life expectancy by 50 years or more. To them, they're all the same thing. They're all database companies. And if you get the data, you can win. So the challenge for us now in the physical world is to learn how to become truly digital. One example of that notion of becoming truly digital is to understand that now money has become digital. Actually, there are a whole range of other assets out there and other tokens of exchange that are just as meaningful as money. So my air miles, the, route, the, the likes I get on the blockchain-based social media platforms, uh, the, the tokens I might earn in return for doing a community service project are all tradable for goods and services. So a lot of companies and a lot of banks and financial services institutions are now being shocked into having to think about how do we accept a lot more than money as a means of payment? How do we exchange this? How are we going to work in a world where this is happening? And that also sets up a kind of reference to different ways in which people are looking at our world. On the one hand, we have those who you know, are coming still from the zombie assumptions about it being a fixed world where the pie is a certain size. If I win, you have to lose. 
very much a Star Trek based, a Star Wars based mentality that says we have to take out the opposition. And then on the other hand, we've got the group of people saying, no, this is a Star Trek opportunity. A range of science and technology innovations are creating abundance that could take us from 78 trillion to 120 trillion as a global economy, where more than half of that is going to, and that will happen over the next seven to 10 years, and more than half will come from businesses and industries that don't yet exist. So we either look at that as a problem, or we say this is a huge source of opportunity and a mechanism to motivate ourselves. And what are some of those science and technology developments? Well, we see a few of them here. I'm not going to go through them all. But just to give you a feel that we know about Moore's Law and Information Technology, that the amount of computer power we can buy for $1,000 doubles roughly every 18 to 24 months. But now we're entering into a world where we're seeing that in other fields. So, for example, Mark Prost in his laboratory in Amsterdam, uh, three years ago, created the world's first lab-grown hamburger. It cost about 325,000 euros. Tasted like your shoes. Uh, last year, same laboratory, same burger, 11 euros, and is now apparently uh, as good as Burger King beef. In two years' time, they expect to be down to 50 cents. That's exponential. It's also transformative. And we're seeing all these technologies also combining in very, very powerful ways to create new solutions to old challenges, but also to enable new industries. And in particular, uh, there's, what's going on there? uh, there's a, a new language being used to describe that combination of those technologies, which we're calling the fourth industrial revolution, which is really about how we're putting those technologies together and then using artificial intelligence to do incredibly clever things with the data that's generated. What do we mean by artificial intelligence? Well, it's about creating algorithms that can perform the functions of the human brain to replicate what a human does. I started my career in AI, uh, and for me, I was very clear on what I wanted to do. I wanted to build software that wasn't smart or smarter than humans. That was my goal. I didn't just want to you know, create chatbots. And, and that's where we are right now. And the reason it's got so exciting, and there's so much interest in it, is the, the wall of money that's been poured into this field by the likes of Amazon, Google, and Baidu, because of the oceans of data that they have to manipulate. And that's really driven everything else in the sector. Uh, it, that's really driven the range of developments going on. One of the things we have to be aware of, though, is that like any new technology, we very quickly move into a hype phase. And with AI, we've kind of got very confused now. We get, uh, there's a hype that says, you know, at one level we have the expert systems that have been calculating our mortgage, uh, our right to have a mortgage for about the last 30 years. At the other end, we have the kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator scenario where we have super intelligent machines deciding that the only uh, role for humans now is to melt us down as fuel for the machines on which the AIs run. And the media would have us believe that there's only a two-week gap between those two stages. Uh, what we want to really help people understand is that this is a critical technology. The goal of the scientists working in the field is to create artificial algorithms that are as smart or smarter than humans. But there's an evolutionary process there. So I'm just going to talk you through that for a few minutes. As I say, the first stage in that is what's been around for the last 30 years. The algorithms that run the autopilots on planes, the sat-nav, um, do automation of processes like uh, determining whether you can have uh, whether your insurance claim is valid, uh, so-called robotic process automation. That's out there now, and that's most of what people are doing when they talk about AI. The next level is where the system is using uh, statistical techniques in a, a process called machine learning to learn from historic data to then be able to provide answers to questions and build up its knowledge base over time. So we see that in chatbots, we see that in, uh, in robo-advisors, helping you choose the right oil for your bike, helping you determine what the right financial product is for you at this stage in your career. And a lot of what's coming to market now fits in that category. A third, more interesting category is where the systems start to have a level of domain expertise that can outperform humans. The most famous example of that right now is DeepMind, uh, a company owned by Google, creating a system called AlphaGo to take on the World Go champion. Uh, they, they beat the, the European champion and then took on the World Go champion and beat him by four games to one. What was interesting there was they didn't teach the system called AlphaGo how to play Go. What they did was taught it a set of learning rules and gave it an, an objective, which was to win. 
and then it started to watch games and determine what its moves should be and humans would nudge it to make slightly better moves and then you know he beat the world well, it beat the world champion but what was interesting is what happened next after that they created a, a, another system called AlphaGo Zero uh, it was like the sibling of AlphaGo and in that case what they did was they gave it the set of learning rules but they didn't tell it anything else and it watched the game for itself worked out a whole new strategy for playing Go and then took on its big brother and beat it by, three, uh, by 100 games to zero after just three days of training itself. That's the kind of level we're at now. We're seeing lots of different examples of that domain-specific expertise. So whether it's uh, BlackRock running their investment funds using AI in this way, whether it's the video cameras you see now all around Russia where they're doing facial recognition, to see if you're a security risk to go, going into the football matches. Uh, that's the kind of state of the art right now in terms of where we are, lots of different examples of it in, in play. The next level uh, is, is where the machines start to have a level of understanding of their own brain and how it works, but also understand, have an understanding of how humans think and human emotions so they can negotiate, so they can reason. Uh, at the moment it's only happening in the labs, but we're gonna see that coming to market in the next two to three years. The next stage on is really where the goal has been for all of us who've been working in artificial intelligence. Uh, this notion of creating artificial general intelligence that is as smart as humans. If you've seen the TV series Humans, you'll see what that looks like. But imagine a world where the machine is as smart as you, and probably smarter because it never gets tired, it never gets emotional, or if it is, it's only simulating it. Um, that's the kind of space we're operating in when we talk about AGI, some people think we'll get there in five years. Others say we'll never get there because we're talking about tackling human consciousness, the intelligence of the body, emotions, things that aren't so easy to understand and replicate. My view is within 10 years, we'll see stuff out there that's as good as artificial and general intelligence for most applications. It won't be true AGI, i.e. it won't be smart in its own right, but it will have so much capability to do machine learning, to process data, to use all these tools, that it will look like AGI. Uh, the next stage on from that is this idea uh, popularized by Nick Bostrom at Oxford, which is that once you get to AI, you'll then go to, uh, to AGI, you'll then move on to super intelligence with machines that are actually smarter than us. Uh, and it's very hard to describe what they'll do because with basic human intelligence, it's hard to describe what a super intelligence might be capable of. But what we can imagine is it might create new economic systems, it might create new political systems, it might find a new way of running our food distribution system so that we don't waste the 40% of fresh food that gets destroyed every year and we could feed everyone on the planet. Uh, some people say that's 20 years away, others say 50, others say never. My view is if we get to AGI, then we'll get to super intelligence within a few years of that. And then finally, there's this kind of goal of the likes of Ray Kurzweil, the, the chief scientist at, at Google. Uh, and his goal is, his belief is that when we get to superintelligence, it will work out how to network our brains, how to share our dreams, how to share our thoughts, but also how to connect to other intelligences around us, like the, the animal intelligence, plant intelligence, weather systems. So we'll create this giant planetary level hive mind. So for us, it's written, that's why we think it's really important that leaders, individuals in society, and pretty much everyone understands what it means when we start talking about AI and why we have to take with a pinch of salt the suggestions from the tech vendors that, oh, AI will never take our jobs or AI will never do this. Well, the goal of the people working in AI is not just to make a better algorithm for calculating your mortgage. The goal is to replace, you know, is to create something as smart as humans or better. And we've got to understand that's the direction of travel we're going in and we have to think about how we respond. To give you a sense of how this is being applied, um, all sorts of fun applications. Uh, this is one where the system uh, actually looks at the price you've paid for an airline ticket and then under US legal regulations, if the airlines have paid, uh, selling that ticket for less to anyone else, you have a right to a refund. And this system just goes off and continuously checks whether or not you do a refund and then does a negotiation for you, uh, which I think is a great way of the technology serving humanity. This is a complete reverse of that, where we're seeing the rise of these so-called decentralized autonomous organizations. This is an insurance company that has no employees. 
you and I as customers go in, we join a pool, we insure each other for let's say a bicycle, when there's a claim, we decide between us what the claim is worth, and at the end of the year any of the money we put in the pot is returned back to us. The system is based on blockchain and AI, but it's the other side of the story where there's no jobs created and there's no, it's not serving humanity in quite the same way in terms of creating jobs, but it's creating a valuable service. But what we can envisage is a world where uh, basically we're, we are surrounded by sort of smart machines and smart apps and we're in a, a sort of a bubble, an ecosystem that, that really um, uh, you know, surrounds us and, and helps manage our world. And clearly we can see this changing everything from industries to job functions and processes. If we try and look ahead then, what are the sort of things we can imagine between now and 2020? Well, I'm not going to read through this whole list, but I think we'll start to be see, you know, start to see AI in schools where the AI will be tutoring kids. And at the other end of the spectrum, we'll start to use AI to really protect ourselves and determine what data we want to give to anyone who wants to interact with us. We take it out slightly further to 2025, then you know, we all know about autonomous vehicles. Very likely that we'll see them everywhere. Uh, a lot of our interactions with any business are likely to be handled by AI. Uh, and we could, if you think about the schooling system, be in a world where entire schools are being run by AI. Uh, whether it's cost pressures or whatever, the, the decisions, the, the, the teaching, the assessment and the personalised delivery will all be done by AI. AI. If we get out to 2035, then that's where we might see these digital tokens that cover everything in place. Uh, we might see AI penetrating literally every sector. And some of these developments that we're talking about, about connecting to animal and ecosystem intelligence, and possibly getting to the, the, the wilder end of the spectrum of ADI, ADI, of AI. So, given all those forces of change that are impacting our world, the question becomes how do we create a very human future within that? There are lots of different views here, but one view is that actually it's so complicated now, and if we try and change political systems, economic systems, or social systems, there's always someone who feels like they're going to lose, and there's someone who we're worried about being an, uh, a, an excessive winner. So there's a, there's a new country being created, or a new nation called Asgardia, which wants to establish a, a platform in space, a colony in space, and I'll put my hand up and acknowledge I have an interest here, I'm actually a, an MP elect for this community. And the reason I'm interested in, in, in this is, is for that very process of working out what new government mod governance models might be or what a new economic model might be for this. What's a fair model for running society, for delivering education? You can't decide these things once you get to the colony, you have to work them out beforehand. And the great thing is we now have over 200,000 citizens registered. It makes us the 172nd biggest population in the world. And those people are largely under 35 and from Asia really wanting to have a different conversation. If we start to have those conversations in the context of Asgardia, the ideas will hopefully bleed out into the rest of society. And because we're not starting from anyone being in power and having it to lose, you can have a very different set of conversations. Back here on Earth, um, we also know that we can't talk about a sustainable future if we haven't tackled the, the, the sustainable development goals as set out by the UN. Equally, we know that everyone is moving uh, the delivery of their services, the way we pay for things, to an electronic format. In order to be a part of that, we need bank accounts. We need mechanisms to hold and store our money. So one of the biggest challenges we face is getting the unbanked across the planet in, into those systems in a, in a smart way. We also know that these technologies raise a whole set of issues from concerns about bias through to the impact on jobs and cultures. Uh, and I think there are a few things that we really need to think about here. One is the way we regulate. There are so many concerns here, from bias through to weaponization of AI, that we can't possibly expect the regulator to deal with it all. They're, they're, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money that the entire AI world has. So the industry developing these solutions has to now start to take ownership of coming up with solutions, proving that their, their solutions are valid and viable, and if you like, underwriting the risks of them going wrong. The market really has to lead on this, you can't expect the regulator to. Similarly, at the, the economic level, we know that AI is now the source of massive international competition between the likes of the US and China. 
Uh, and there is a concern that the, the wealth coming out of it could be consolidated in the hands of a few, which is why a lot of people are talking about the potential to nationalize AI, so governments own it, and then license it back to the marketplace so the profits can be used for things like job creation, funding the next waves of research and development, and encouraging new ventures. And then I think we're also at the point where we need to think beyond just this next 10 to 15 years and think about that world where AI might have replaced more jobs than it creates. What does the post-AI economy look like and how do we start to prepare people to live and survive and navigate that world? And one of the issues there is around the potential for people to lose their jobs. We've all heard about guaranteed basic incomes, but I think there are other options here as well around conditional incomes where you give people a top up to take them to a certain level if they don't earn enough. Uh, looking at new taxation models that start to see a fairer distribution of tax, a simpler tax system, and actually collecting the money that people are supposed to pay. And also looking at models like total employment responsibility that says you're responsible for a certain number of jobs in the economy, whether they work for you, whether they're subcontractors, or whether you help create those jobs in other businesses. But we need to be doing the experiments now before it's too late. We also need to think about the skills uh, that we're going to need to deliver this from the education system, right, uh, the schooling system, right the way through to adult education. In our view, uh, within five to ten years, 80% or so of the jobs, new jobs created are likely to require a graduate level of education. So we have about five years to really transform here in the UK the provision of adult education, the nudging of people to do life-wide learning, to start acquiring the skills that give them the confidence to then learn more complicated uh, skills to take on different jobs and the social skills to help them move from job to job. We also have to recognise that uh, society is already very stressed. Last year in the UK over 30,000, 300,000 people quit their work because of mental health issues. The things I've talked about are only likely to add to that. So we have to think about how do we de-stress society, how do we de-stress the workplace, and what provisions do we need to put in place to have more counsellors and therapists in the marketplace to support us all. At the organisational level, uh, dealing with all this seems pretty daunting, so we have to start thinking about creating the time and space for change, stopping things that are no longer valid as meetings, reports and activities. We also need to think about how we raise literacy. One of the things we know is that uh, around $800 billion a year is wasted on IT projects that fail. Half of that is due to poor literacy. People at the top not understanding the technology and what it's capable of when they sign up for it. People inside the organisation not having the tech skills or the understanding of how to use the technology to get the best from it. And then developers who aren't as good as we'd hoped they might be. And so we really have to think about literacy and, and digital literacy in particular as critical to organisational survival and growth in the future. We also uh, need to think about taking a, a three different time perspectives as we look at our organisation. Firstly, looking at uh, what do we need to do in the next 12 months to really move the needle forward. And in, in that, in, within that, in particular, deepening our level of customer in, intimacy, really understanding them and how they see their world, and equally the same perspective on our employees, how are their views of the world changing, what are their needs. And then on the one to three year time scale, really looking at where are we going to drive growth from, how do we build our digital capability and how do we innovate on our service. And then finally, the four to ten year time frame is looking at what might be coming over the horizon and thinking about whilst we can't do anything with that today, what new scenarios might that create for us on a four to ten year basis, well, two or three different scenarios. And then thinking about well, what kind of strategies do we need to pursue in the next three years to make sure we're fit enough, flexible enough and forward-thinking enough to respond to whatever might happen. And finally, it's about thinking about what are the skill sets we need to be developing in our people to help them navigate from problem solving to scenario thinking right the way through to actually having the skills to make sense of any context they're working in and deal with imperfect information. At the workplace level, I think we do have to think about what do we do in the workplace on a continuous basis to make sure our people aren't feeling like the system is overloading them. And the people we do release, what do we do for them? Well, one thing is we're moving a lot of our learning programs online. 
So we could very easily make those available to the employees who we've made redundant so they can keep learning even though they're no longer with us. So that's been a fairly rapid canter through some of the forces that are shaping the, the level of uh, technological complexity, political uncertainty, and economic turbulence. And then the ideas, some of the ideas around how we start to do that to build resilience across society for individuals, for nations, and for businesses. I hope that's made sense, and in the words of Gandhi, go for it. Thank you.